Hello everyone, my name is Bradley, and today we're going to be talking about fingerprints, but not the ones on your fingertips, rather the fingerprints that you leave behind, actually those that your device leaves behind all over the internet. And it's precisely these so-called device fingerprints that are often weaponized by scammers and online criminals to do bad things. If you're watching this, you're probably old enough to remember the first smartphones, right? Now, one of the biggest problems with these old smartphones was that they'd get quite greasy from constant use. So we'd end up using special phone cases or screen protectors to keep our devices clean. But luckily, smartphones nowadays have special grease-resistant surfaces, which you might not know. So while our physical fingerprints no longer stain our phone screens, our devices can still leave digital fingerprints all over the internet. So a device's fingerprint is effectively its unique digital identifier. Now, my fingerprints are made out of hundreds of different papillary ridges, right? But device fingerprints, on the other hand, consist of hundreds of data points. And these could be things such as the operating system that the device uses, serial numbers, applications, the different settings, and so on. Now, based on these parameters, you can actually identify any individual device. Device fingerprinting is actually pretty common practice across hundreds of thousands of different websites. And according to the New York Times, 3.5% of popular websites do exactly this. And that figure is obviously steadily increasing. So how does this all work? So to access a particular website, your browser needs to provide certain information about your device to that website. For instance, this could be information about your screen size, and the website effectively needs that so that it can open the correct website format. And there are hundreds of other parameters just like this. Now, individually, they're not particularly unique, right? But when you add them all together, you really get something truly unique, a device fingerprint, so to speak. In order to connect to the web, it'll come as no surprise that every device needs to have an IP address. Any website we open will subsequently be able to see our address and they can actually tell where we are based on it. Now, sometimes they can only tell the country you're in, right? But other times they can actually pinpoint your exact location and that's all done through the IP address. But the thing is, our devices connect to the internet through what's known as an intermediary, right? Or in other words, a sort of operator network. This then connects to the internet. So even though each computer has its own unique address, when you're surfing the web, you'll actually be identified by this intermediary network address rather than that of your device. Now, you can think about this like trying to get through to a large company. There's, of course, one main number, but that number actually corresponds to thousands of different lines, right? But if you need to reach a particular line, then you'd need to dial the extension. So you can think of the main number as the operator network, right? But your device is more like the extension. Don't answer go, that call. Just transfer the damn call. Your call is very important to us. Please. Hey! Oh! So if you happen to visit the same website from the same device from different locations, this would actually be reflected in your IP address since you're actually going through different networks. Now, how about you go try this yourself? Go on, what is my IP address? And they'll tell you where you're located simply based on your IP. I should actually note that device fingerprinting has implications that go well beyond detecting your location. Websites can actually use device fingerprinting to adjust their content based on demographics, wants or needs and interests. For example, if you enter an online store, let's say sort of harrods.com from a wealthy area, well, that website will actually show you its most expensive items first, which is quite mad. You were correct. It's fact. We all access the internet using different devices, right? This could be a smartphone or it could be a smart TV. And these devices don't just differ in terms of their sizes. They actually have different operating systems, different browsers, language settings, and so on, right? And websites, they track all of this information. Now, once you add up all of these individual factors, it's hard to imagine having the same device fingerprint as the next guy. Now, of course, it's theoretically possible, but highly unlikely. Accordingly, the more parameters you have, the more unique your device fingerprint will actually become. Now, do you want to see how unique you are? Well, check out this website. Now, its database contains over 3 million digital fingerprints from a variety of different devices. And if you go through the list of parameters, you'll see how many users share the same browser, language settings, and so on.
You see, all it took was for me to add a new weird font and my uniqueness actually went up significantly. Now my uniqueness also has a lot to do with my browser. And now I'm going to do the same test, but I'm going to use a different browser. Take a look at these abstract images. This is one of the more advanced technologies for determining a particular browser. Basically, when you use a browser, it draws a small picture. And this picture actually reflects the browser that you use. And thanks to this data, the probability that your device fingerprint actually matches someone else's is actually 1 in 286,777. So let's talk about cookies. Now, cookies were effectively small packets of data that websites actually save to your computer. And I'm sure that once or twice you've clicked on the allow cookies icon when browsing the internet, right? But have you ever actually thought about what this means for your privacy? Well, yes, there are many benefits to using cookies and they do indeed help websites to function better. For instance, they can save information that makes the user experience much more smooth and personal, like your personal search settings or even your login information, right? But the bad news is that cookie files can be easily compromised by bad actors, especially when one doesn't have an encrypted internet connection. Now, this risk increases particularly when using public Wi-Fi at your local cafe, for instance. In essence, cookies have severe implications for your privacy when browsing the web. And that's why many browsers actually offer a service that blocks the cookies altogether. But doing so means that certain websites actually won't function at all. Now, one thing I do suggest is to allow cookies, but regularly delete them from your computer, say at least once a week. And don't do this through your browser. Do it actually manually or with a dedicated program. Now, there is another way to uniquely identify your device, and this is through tracking the websites that you visit. Now, if someone knows which popular websites I do or don't visit, they'll actually have a 90% chance of successfully identifying me. Now, websites don't have the ability to see my browsing history, but, well, I mean, you know you can tell when you visited a link just by the color of it, right? So it goes from blue to purple. Well, some sneaky types actually figured out how to use this against us. To figure out where I've been, bad actors compile long lists of links to particular websites. And if I visit one of these links, they'll actually change the color to purple. Now, what they're doing here isn't actually that difficult. On the one hand, they can't exactly detect your entire internet history through this method. But still, by analyzing the most popular 50 websites, they're still getting half the way there, right? Now, the technical information links to our devices is a whole other story. Yes, I mean, I could distort this information by changing my operating system or blocking cookies, IP blockers, and so forth. And that's not really hard to do. But what's more difficult is actually changing the physical characteristics of my devices. Now, let's come back to IamUnique.org. Now, you can see here that there's actually data on audio systems used by the devices, like speakers and microphones, for instance. So if I were to connect some kind of audio device to my MacBook, like a Bluetooth speaker, for instance, the uniqueness of this device actually increases considerably. But look, guys, disconnecting a speaker from your device is no big deal, really. Yes. But what if someone could figure out the specifics of the chip inside of your phone, for instance? After all, this is a component that you really can't change. And this was actually an issue that browser developers saw beforehand. So they've actually taken measures to prevent the primary specs of your device from being accessed. But this is not to say that there aren't certain exceptions to this. Now, in May of 2019, a group of researchers from Cambridge published a study about a unique device fingerprint that was developed through the use of an IMU sensor. Now, these are effectively microscopic chips that allow smartphones to determine their whereabouts and physical positions within the world, right? Now, these sensors are extremely sensitive, and each of them contain data that is truly unique. So how can an IMU sensor be accessed through a browser when browsers do so much to prevent this from even happening in the first place? Well, have you ever noticed how websites rotate together with your phone screen? Well, that's actually done through a direct line of communication between the browser and the IMU sensor. 
Now, this is just one method, but there are actually dozens of other ways to determine a truly unique device fingerprint. And obviously, for time constraints, I can't get into all of them today. Now, how would you like to hear about how to take control of your device fingerprint? And now you can enjoy a little more privacy in your life. Well, the idea here is to simplify your fingerprint as much as possible by reducing the amount of identifiable information that you provide. But you don't need to restore your phone to factory settings to do so, right? You can actually just install a second operating system on your device and effectively keep it completely unchanged. Don't add any weird fonts and certainly don't delete any of the native ones, for instance. Then you need to download a safe browser and don't add anything on that either. No plugins, language selectors, or anything like that. I mean, all of that can actually lead to identifiable information being collected from you. I would probably disable cookies, JavaScript, Flash, and WebGL to start. And obviously it goes without saying, when accessing the internet, always use a VPN connection. This will help you to hide your IP address. Now, there are actually thousands of services out there and some are actually free to use, so give it a Google. Now, this is kind of similar to putting a pair of gloves on before you commit a robbery. And because of this, you'll leave a less identifiable trace of yourself. Is this a bit too radical for you, though? Well, I mean, here's a simpler approach. You can simply download Firefox and install a plugin that purposefully provides false information about your device. Now, I like to use an agent switcher, but there are plenty of different alternatives you'll find on the internet. In the plugin settings, you'll need to make sure that your uniqueness is as low as possible. The similarity ratio should be green on amiunique.org. Now, this could be a real pain, but it's really worth the effort for privacy, right? But this method makes me think about how criminals could technically pose as someone else, right? Just by simulating another device's fingerprint. Now, in the online jungle, this really is a possibility. In February of 2019, cybersecurity experts discovered a website that was selling 60,000 device fingerprints. That's right, 60,000. And this was a store where you could literally purchase someone else's digital identity and use it for malicious intent. Now think about it, your iPhone's device fingerprint could have been listed for sale on that website. Now you maybe didn't even know that your device had one of these fingerprints, yet it's there, up for sale on the dark web. Now these tended to cost between five and $200 each. The price obviously depends how dense the information is. And using these stolen identities, criminals can actually fool banks and circumvent certain anti-fraud systems. So how does this all work? Well, when you enter your bank card information in an online store, the smoking system carefully analyzes the quest and does two things. First of all, it checks whether the information is correct. And then it checks whether your device fingerprint coincides with the ones that you've used in the past. Now, if the data here more or less matches, it permits the transaction. Now, obviously, when you have someone else's device fingerprint, it's much easier to bypass these types of security systems. Now, a good question here is, can you protect your device fingerprint from being stolen and sold on the dark web? Yes, you can. And the easiest way to make your device fingerprint unappealing to bad actors is by making it as generic as possible. The less unique your device fingerprint is, the less likely it will be of interest to anyone on the dark web. So, do you occupy yourself with hiding your device fingerprint completely, or do you just relax, live, and let it go? Well, it's honestly a tough question, especially for me, but my aim is not only to show you the technologies that are destroying our privacy, but also to warn you about the dangers that are lurking in every corner of the internet, and that also some of these dangers can stem from something as ordinary as the device that you hold in your hand. So look, thanks for watching, and by the way, if you've got any other ideas for another video that we could do, please, please drop us a comment. As a lot of you already know, I'm reading meticulously every single one of the comments. If you want to connect with me or share an idea that's burning in your mind, please, please do comment, because I'll definitely see it and share it with our wonderful team here. Otherwise, thank you for accompanying me on this excursion through the online jungle. I'm Bradley, and this is SumSub. See you in the next video.